And before we uh, get to our scripture reading and uh, and then to Ryan coming up to preach, I wanted to invite you up if you want to come, Shane. Yeah, definitely. I would love that. Shane went recently. Well, you know, I'll just let him. Five minutes? Break. Three minutes? Half a minute. Half, half a minute? Five minutes. <laughs> 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 yeah, I was going to say, yeah, you don't, you don't know me well. I can't hear you. Half a minute. <laughs> yeah, anyways, uh, thanks for having me come up front. I just wanted to share a little bit about some training that I went through recently. Um, but first off, I'll just say, my name is Shane Gorman. Uh, I actually work here in this building, not specifically with the Forge, but with for Youth for Christ, right? Um, uh, I've been here about a year. Um, and so I went away to a training that was supposed to be for anyone who's within their first or second year on staff with Youth for Christ. Um, so I qualified to go to this training. Um, and it was a, it was a five day, uh, but I'm not going to give you a breakdown of every single day because there's limited time, right? But there were some big takeaways that I had that I just wanted to share with you guys. So day one was called the, like our discipleship training. And so there was something called the four chairs of discipleship training. And so I'd never heard this until actually going to this training. And I wish that I'd heard it sooner. So I'm like, you know what? If I have an opportunity to share with my church family, I really want to do that because, you know, and the whole idea here, and actually, I, I had a Bible verse, didn't memorize it in time, um, but we're, we're called to make disciples of all nations, all nations, right? This is our mission, right? To go out and preach the gospel and get people excited about what Jesus has done for us and be reconciled with God. And so uh, the four chairs is pretty much number one. I, I don't have any visuals. I, I got one chair up here, but just pretend there's four. So chair one is for people who have not... Um, came and saw Jesus. And so, uh, the, maybe you know some of these Bible stories, but I'll just give two examples. But the woman at the well, when she went back to the city, you know, she's a, she's a woman, plenty of men, looking at her like, oh, you're, you know, you're kind of, you know, I don't know, I don't know if I can trust you. And she just says, come and see, come and see Jesus. Right? You know, don't take my word for it. Come and see him. And you know, very similarly, when he healed the man with leprosy, it was just come and see Jesus. So that's, that's, the, that's number one. Get people in that seat. Just come and see Jesus, right? This is what's so cool. I've been, I've been gone a lot. I, over April, May, I've not been here a lot. Um, and so just coming back here now and just seeing almost every chair being filled is really excited, right? Because that just means at least people are in the come and see stage, right? Number two is follow Jesus. As you, after you've heard the gospel, if that, if that hasn't stirred up something in you, you might be in, in chair one for a while, but if something stirs up in you and you're like, I want to know more about this Jesus guy. I've seen him. I've heard about what he can do through the lives of others, my pastor and my mentors and, and these sorts of things. What do I do next? Let's well, follow Jesus. And then chair three is be fishers of men, right? Jesus is talking with disciples. I'm not just going to, you know, bring you guys lots of fish when you go out on your boat. Like, I want, I want you to help build my kingdom. You know, I want you to build my family with me. Right? And so, as we're moving from, okay, I want to follow Jesus, now what do I do? We go to that third chair, which is try to become competent and try to be as effective as we can in sharing what Christ has done for us to the fullness of it, right? So that people can really grasp all that God has done for us, right? And then the last chair is called bear fruit and go, right? So as we're making more disciples and we're sharing our faith and we're, we're excited about what Jesus has done, we're going into that fourth chair where we can start to bear fruit. The Holy Spirit's going to enact in us to, to be able to live out the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So um, that was an awesome day because a big part of my job is working with youth is getting them into that chair one and just hoping that they you know, stick around long enough to get to that fourth chair where they they can bear good fruit and share it with the community too, right? Um, so day two was uh, um, it was like a like a mental health day. I don't I won't I don't have a lot to share about that day. It was really really good training, um, but uh, it was a, it was a Christian trainer too, which was really cool. She just mentioned that sometimes within Christian circles, the big issue is that that oh you're not praying enough. You're not reading your Bible enough. You're not going to church enough. And as much as these things are really, really, really important, sometimes it's 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 a dip. there's body, mind, and spirit that she talked about. And so maybe if you're doing all the praying you can and things aren't changing. You're doing all the Bible reading you can and things aren't changing. You're at church. You're going to your social circles. You're at your your different small groups and these sorts of things. And and something's not being fixed. Right? So she just said we can't neglect that it. it could be a nervous system thing. 
It could be a body thing. It could be a mental health thing. And, you know, there's so many other things that we need to be looking at. And so she really, really struck on the nervous system. And so if you don't notice, I'm breathing really, really fast because I'm excited and I get anxious, right? And so she just said, Shane, when that happens, you just got to take four seconds of breathing in, four seconds of holding it, and then four seconds of breathing out. And I'm not good at that. I don't take time to do that. I'm a very fast breathing person, right? So maybe I'll do that afterwards. But I'm up here and I got a lot to say, so we need to get it out in the next 45 seconds. <laughs> um, so yeah, just never, never think that God's not answering your prayers because you're not praying hard enough. Never think that your, your church family's not surrounding you in love because you're not going there enough. You know, these sorts of things, it very well could be a, a body or a mind thing that's going on and not as much a spiritual thing. So just remember that when you're going through hardship. Um, day three was just cultural intelligence. Um, a lot of, if I, I'm not going to make you do it, but if I were to say, can I ask you to stand please? The majority of you would have this sort of instinctual, like, oh, I better stand. He's asking you to stand. But the words I used was, can I ask you to stand? Right? And, and this is not my example. The, the guy that was uh, doing this lesson or this training, his name was, was Daryl. And he said, you know, I go all over the world training people. And when I say that, I assume that everyone's going to stand after I ask that question. But when I'm in different countries, they're very literal. Right? They just go, yes. You can ask me to stand, but they won't they won't actually get up and stand, right? And so yeah, just being aware that if we're gonna make disciples of all nations, we need to be aware of those sorts of things. People's backgrounds, you know, like what sort of maybe traumas does that have they been through in their life that might make it hard for them to accept the love of Jesus, these sorts of things. So um, and then day four was just social media. I hate social media. Um, I hate it. I, the only thing I barely know how to work is Facebook. Barely know how to work Facebook, but the snapper graphics and Twitteramas and the <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I, I'm so bad at it. But this this man was just saying, hey, you know, this is a huge part of teens' lives. They know what the snapper graphics are. They know how to use the. <laughs> so it's like if we really want to minister to them, that they, you know, they spend about sixty percent of their day looking at their phones. Maybe I don't. Know. I don't know. Maybe that's an overestimate. Um, but he just picked, basically what I got from that is Shane, instead of picking on kids for using those programs, maybe try it. Give her a go, right? But he also pre-warned us too. He's like, guys, computers are really smart these days. These algorithms, I don't know exactly what that means, but apparently these phones memorize what you do. So when you're on the computer and you're looking at puppy dogs, it's gonna it's gonna program more pictures of puppy dogs for you the next day. Right? And so it, it was really, really cool for him to just say, be careful. Right? If you want to minister to kids, you want to start using these programs. So I, I, I hide from them because I hate the internet. There's so much filth on there. There's so much filth and I just go, okay, well, I just want to stay away from it all. But he's like, if you really want to build up strong masculine integrity, you want to be able to discipline, self-control, you got to be in these programs and teach kids how to use them properly because they're such a threat. So anyways, that's that. Um, that was my training. Thank you so much for listening to me. Um, I'm just going to finish with that. And uh, yeah, just once again, thank you for letting me speak. You went 20 seconds over time. Oh, wow. Thank you. No, I was kidding. <laughs> I had no idea. That was fine, man. That was great. Okay. Um, so, before we call Brian up, let me uh, read the scripture passage for this morning, if you have your Bible with you. And I hope you always try to remember to bring either a physical Bible or a Bible app with you. Uh, we're going to read 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. So we urged Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to, be, to bring also to completion the act, to this act, sorry, this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, 
see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. And here is my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have a desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard-pressed, that there may be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in time, sorry, so that in turn their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality, as it is written. The one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. Brian Clausen is here speaking today. Uh, he is, for those who don't know, he's my cousin, and he uh, used to be a youth pastor as well, and he works at in Windsor. And uh, so, yeah, thank you very much. Also, I noticed some of our relatives out today, and uh, you know, feel free to come back out on Sundays. Even those that live in Windsor, come back anyways every Sunday. <laughs> Thank you, Frank, for coming to speak. So, can I ask you to stand? <laughs> Just <laughs> for me, I'm trying to try to. <laughs> I, I have to say that um, it takes me back to, oh gosh, how many years ago was it? The second church I was at. Because I thought when Shane was coming up here, he was like, oh, he's got some young guys. Oh, he's giving his testimony about something's going on in his life. And like, wait a sec, he's not a teenager. He works with teenagers. <laughs> and then I thought, wait a sec, how old is he? Because he doesn't like social media. <laughs> so, but I took him back because the second church I went to, that's what the people in the church were saying when, when, I, when we came to the church. Is this guy any older than our teenagers that he's going to serve? <laughs> So, anyway, you don't have to tell me age, but you're looking good for whatever age you are. Thank you. <laughs> um, I hope I'll be getting to all kinds of uh, intro about me. Uh, I was here a year ago, and some of you weren't here, that's fine. Um, just, it's not real important. Um, I'm just here because Billy asked me to come, and I'm happy to be here and would love to share, uh, as I don't do this too often. Um, so, it's great to be here again, uh, my hometown. Old stocking ground, sort of. Uh, I mean, where I grew up, right? So it's good to be back. Um, you know, yeah. when we return home, even when you're just visiting, you just yeah, you get nostalgia, you get all these feelings that come up, uh, your youth and so on. And, and then you see someone where you were once before, and you're like, my goodness, I wish I was that age again. <laughs> <laughs> Doing it all over in the youth. Uh, so let me ask you a question. Uh, what is the first thing you think of when you first wake up? I remember God. Wow, that is not in the top four. <laughs> but that's interesting. <laughs> if I were to ask you what consumes your thoughts as you go about your day working, parenting, shopping, you're in school, homework, managing your house, managing your household, managing your life, what would you say you think about the most throughout your day? Let me ask you if you do this. Do you, with each shopping transaction you make, mentally run a total in your head as you go about? Typically our errands are almost always financial related. So do you do that? Do you think about how much your check will be this week as it gets closer to payday? Do you regularly think about when adding a new streaming service, a piece of furniture, another vehicle, or a vacation, how that will fit into your budget. If your mind's on your money, and your money's on your mind, you are normal. And thank you, Snoop Dogg, for that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't know you know who that is, but a lot of us do. Even young people. Like I said, it's, it's there forever. <laughs> Researchers would say that the first thing you think about, now this is new, okay, this has changed a bit in the last, I don't know, I guess we'd say 12 years or so, 
the first thing we think about is our phone. That wasn't the case with your smartphones. No one reached for their phone the first thing in the morning. In fact, I would say, as Christians, one of the first things we reached for was probably a Bible, right? Not so much anymore. The second thing that you actually think about, which used to be the first, is money. Or something money-related. Money is a very sensitive topic to most people. In general, people like to talk about money, the cost of things, winning the lottery, people's misfortunes, people's fortunes. It's a topic much like the weather. It's an all-around safe, non-threatening topic that's very surface. We like to talk about it, right? But when it becomes personal, suddenly the topic becomes taboo. People are quick to draw lines on perceived ideas of money, how it's to be shared and how it's to be distributed. People ascribe value to ideas, to workload, and who should get how much. It is also one of the most divisive topics in marriages. Money problems do not escape the church neither. Believe it or not, there are a few topics, important topics pastors try to avoid. 55% of topics, sorry, 55% of pastors speak only rarely or not at all on certain topics. So some of these are quite surprising, at least to me. This includes politics, abortion, homosexuality, same-sex marriage, war, women's role in the church. And two of them are things that Jesus talked about quite a bit. After speaking about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven interchangeably in the Gospels, Jesus talked about salvation and faith. Following that, the third most popular topic or what Jesus spoke about was hell. Following that is money. If you are part of a church that has not talked about any of these issues in the past few years, you are at the wrong church. Money has a very specific context in the Bible. Because what you don't find is straightforward answers on how to budget or how to spend your money. There's no specific guidelines uh, on how to use your money, how to plan the usage of your money. Money is really a theological concept that we have to try to understand in all of its ways and the ways laid out in, in Scripture. It's, it's often and almost always related to a personal view or a relation, relationship to money, the relationship that we have to money. And it's often a correction of how we think about it. Where we like to hide and pretend, the Bible likes to unmask. Paul had no issues talking about money and how to bring this deep and oversensitive topic to the forefront. He had no problem speaking of his financial troubles and successes. Philippians, the book of Philippians, he talks in detail about that. He also had no problem asking for it and expectation to receive it. To him, to others, and to those in great need. On this occasion, in 2 Corinthians here, Paul addresses the collection that was for the church in Jerusalem. It's not certain what the collection was for. It's believed that was likely due to a drought. Uh, the drought that didn't just affect Jerusalem, however, either. Um, whatever the need, Paul had high expectations for the Corinthian church. So why is something that's so valued, so dear to us, needed and used daily such a difficult topic of conversation in the church? Why do people avoid the discussion? Why do pastors avoid talking about it? Some pastors. A place where we're supposed to let it all go, so to speak, a place where being personal and, and real is valued and expected. Why do we become so tight-fisted and offended when we are asked for money? Are there times where we can are there times where we can decline to give and walk away with a clear conscience? Do I have to, when I make a transaction and I'm asked to, if I want to round up to the nearest dollar for a charity when I make a debit transaction? Or go to the grocery store, you're again asked for money. Do you want to donate $2 to a particular charity when it's time to pay? Are you obliged, should you feel guilty for turning that down? 
It's possible. Oh, we do have that up on the screen. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. You go ahead. Okay. It's possible to give guilt-free when we consider how God's economy works through uh, through generosity. Oh, sorry. Point point over here. My apologies. Right. Oh, where are we going? There. Laptop. Yeah. Okay. We're good. <laughs> oh, no, it still doesn't work. What happened? No, it's, it's good. Oh, that's right. Okay. All right, so get comfortable uh, because this discussion might be a little comfortable for us. Generous giving is based on a clear understanding of God's work in your life. So I want to draw your attention to the specific words extreme poverty, verse 2. If you've got your Bibles, you get your phones on, whatever. It's a very specific term, and when we read the Bible, um, every word is in its place for a reason. Translators are very careful in the translation, and there really are no throwaway words. So the extreme word uh, in there referred to something greater than just being poor. Uh, the reason for the Corinthians and why they were to be generous was based on the Macedonians. Macedonians would include Church of Philippians, Church of Philippi, Church of Thessalonica. Those were part of the Macedonian churches and also Berea is there as well. Um, <clears throat> but the, the Macedonian churches, I think, also were ex possibly experiencing the same as what Jerusalem was. Um, because they weren't just poor, they were extremely poor. They lived in abject poverty. There are different levels of poverty. Um, like you can say there are different levels of wealth. If you can pay rent, if you can get food every week, if you can have your heat on in the winter time, but you can't go on vacation and you can never go out to eat, you might be considered poor. Right? If you have to bring in your barbecue to heat your house in the winter time because you don't have heat on, you can't afford it, and if you're going through the trash bins to get your food, you live in abject poverty. That's really poor. And I know there's some people here um, who grew up having to you, uh, use cow dung to heat their food, right? So you get the idea of what it means to be not just poor, but quite a bit uh, in, in the, you know, in the dire, dire straits of poverty. After the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, there were reports that people were picking through animal waste to get pieces of barley to eat, just to feed themselves. That's where the source of food came from for some people. Not just the people that were already middle class or somewhat poor, but that was the wealthy as well were doing that. Verse 3, they gave according to the means, they gave beyond their means. So here are the Macedonians in abject poverty, yet are giving beyond their means. <clears throat> if you know, if it's safe to say that in almost every city and community, there is some areas that are wealthy, some areas that are somewhat wealthy, areas that are okay. You know, you, you move into different areas of town, you see, you can see that wealth is different, right? If you are familiar with the kind of the, the poverty, the impoverished areas of town, you know that they often give out of what they don't have. When they know someone's in need, they're on whether they're on welfare, whether they're on disability, whatever it is, in, in those situations, or they've just lost their job, or they're just they have addictions and so it keeps them from functioning in a workplace. For whatever reason someone is impoverished, it's not always for bad reasons, um, you will know that there in that community is a sense of sharing. I can tell you that it's rare in the wealthy areas of town that that concept of sharing is understood in the same manner. It seems Paul expected the Macedonians to give according to their income, but acknowledged that they went well beyond his expected, especially since they were broke. 
Politicians love to use percentages, and I, there was a couple examples that I really wanted to use, and it was from opposite sides of the political spectrum, but I thought, I don't want to come into politics because then it'll just run through your mind, and uh, I don't want that controversy. <laughs> we don't need it. But the point is, politicians use, like to use percentages to explain balance. Uh, and uh, like I said, I don't want to take a political side here, but this is a good relationship as we understand God's economy. Uh, we'll explain this. So there's a big difference, let's say, between someone who makes 30000 and someone who makes 300000 right? Giving 10%, 3000 for 30, 30000 for 30, 300000 So that's, that's an easy thing to figure out. Um, politicians would say that the higher tax, or the, the higher yield of taxes with 300000 is a whole lot more than the 3000 that someone is giving or paying on 30000 right? Just 3000 so there's a substantial difference between that amount of uh, 30000 that someone who's wealthy would pay between someone who's 3000 and thus wealthy people should need to pay more taxes, right? That's the argument. Because they give 10 times more to taxes than someone paying 30000 It makes sense from that standpoint. It's fair. But God's economy is quite a bit different. It's very different, actually, and Jesus made this clear. Luke 21, if you want to reference it, look at it at some point. Um, somewhere else here? No, no, okay. Um, there, when Jesus saw a woman approaching the temple, she was giving her donation. I think a lot of you know the story, and I think actually there was someone that preached on this sometime last year, I think, in your church. Um, but she gave pretty much next to nothing. Um, and as the rich people walked by and donated their money, it was substantially more. Um, after all, 30000 is, again, like I said, 10 times more than 3000 It's a lot of money. In fact, $30,000, take this building here, probably pays your heating and hydro for a year. Right? Some churches it does. Some churches even pays the mortgages. It's, it's quite a bit in terms of timing. However, in God's economy, 30000 is meager when it comes from someone who has a whole lot of it. That was the point that Jesus made. There is nothing sacrificial in what those rich people gave at the temple. There was no real act of generosity in giving when it was ten times easier to give. Acts of services are not a substitute for giving. This is verse 6 and 7. Some people believe that if they volunteer more hours than what is expected, it, be, it, becomes, it then becomes an equivalent to giving money. There's also another uh, theory that people have that when they put their kids into a private Christian school, that five or eight or ten thousand dollars is their, their tithing. They include that in the tithe. Um, However, that's not what you're paying for. You are paying for a private education. I mean, if we took the word Christian out of that school, that would just be a private school. And all of a sudden, well, is that really a tie? No. Either way, it's not a tie. Um, but it becomes equivalent in people's minds to giving money. That if we overserve, I have an excuse to give less. You can't outserve your financial responsibility. That's like saying, I'm going to spring clean every month in my home, every corner of the house, so that I don't have to make a mortgage payment. That's about the equivalent. Yeah. Wouldn't that be great? I would spring clean every week. I would spring clean for you so that you could give me your mortgage payment. Hey, I spring clean. Can I? I'll take that. This is perhaps what Paul was getting, getting at when he said, but as you excel in everything, see that you excel in this act of grace also. And Paul's writing in the second Corinthian is a little more, I don't know if it's a delicate, but a little more nuanced than the first Corinthians. Because first Corinthians, um, it's kind of like issue after issue, if, if you follow along the text, and it was all 
very difficult things and very blatant uh, things that the church was doing that was, that was wrong, that was sinful. And he just went out head on and very straightforward. Um, part of Paul's nuanced writing here, or where he's a little more diplomatic and tactful, is because his leadership as an apostle was still being challenged by some people in the Corinthian church. And also because what he was dealing with was actually less blatant because there was um, things that he could address in more detail to a more mature audience. There was some maturity that took place in the Corinthian church. He recognized that it was growth, right? At the same time, he gently made it clear that in the matters of money, there was some work to be done on their part. And let's face it, there is always work to be done on our part in this regard. Spiritual growth in one area does not mean spiritual growth in all areas. Your leaders are required to recognize your spiritual needs and weaknesses and address them with you. You are being offended by that isn't because your toes have been stepped on, but rather the evident immaturity on, being, on your part in a particular matter. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with being at a state of immaturity, right? But, you know, we want to move on from immaturity. Verse 89, generosity is an indicator test of genuine faith that mirrors Christ's humility. Paul says this as he starts it, that it is not as a command. Okay, so here's where you get to kind of just relax a little, because... There is no one that should be strong-armed into giving or serving. It is not the approach that we take as, as pastors, as leaders. That's not how we understand the things that we're supposed to freely give to each other and to God. However, if there is no desire or joy in the selfless acts, then there is a deep spiritual danger that lies in your soul. God does not need your mind. He does not need your money. He owns, this is Psalms 50 by the way, the cattle on a thousand hills. The world is his and everything in it. There is no need for you to give money to God, right? You're just giving back money to him that's already his. I'm sure you've heard that before. It's nothing new. But he doesn't need your money. He doesn't even need us, in a sense, to do his work, because he's going to have it fulfilled. Whether we are on board or not, whether we give or not, his will will be accomplished. His sovereign will will come to fruition. It will happen. However, he does give us the opportunity, and that is how he's looking at it at the Christian Church. Here is an opportunity for you, in this instance, to help the people in Jerusalem who are your brothers and sisters. Verse 9, though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. I would say this is the crux of the passage. This is the reason um, for us to be generous. Well, let's be clear on what humility is and isn't. Humility, humility is not something subjective. Jesus' work on the cross, him coming to earth, sorry, him coming to earth um, was a physical act. It was a, a, an act of service, an act of obedience to God the Father. And the love in the Bible. Like love in the Bible, humility is an act. It's not what we perceive about a person, it's about what a person does that shows humility. And Christ's example of his tangible living with us physically was a great example. How we interacted with people, how we talked about money, even though in, you're in leadership, even though he had authority, doesn't mean he wasn't humble. You can be humble and have authority. 
He became physical in a, in a world largely hostile to himself. It takes a lot of humility to live sacrificially for haters without complaining. The whole point of giving is to demonstrate humility and your reliance on your Creator. This is one way in which we show our faith, how we exercise our faith in, in God. It's about trust, and there's nothing more that I can think of that shows trust than us being generous, us being willing to give in, in all aspects, in whatever way that means, whatever way that is. Um, money, service, and it is a test. In fact, this your life here on earth is a test. Your whole life is a test here. It's always an opportunity for you to see someone else's need, for you to grow, for you to become more Christ-like. Christians in North America are quite reserved about the topic of money and personal wealth, but at the same time, we're happy to showcase our wealth by what we drive in the house or houses we live in. So, in Windsor, uh, I, didn't, I didn't think of a good example here in Syria, but I'm, I'm sure it'll come to your mind as I can specify really my area. So, we live not far from the river and across, and you can see the Renaissance Center downtown Detroit. I love the riverfront. Um, it's great. But as you move away from downtown, um, you get the riverfront property, the houses. And from one side, because you only can see it from the, the side of the road, because the other side is the river. These are houses that are giant and beautiful and ornate, sparing no expense. These people spare no expense on these houses. And, and used to be, if you guys went further down towards Tuskegee, you went east, there were smaller houses. Over time, over the last couple 20 years, I'd say, about 20 years, um, there has been a change. And as, as people that build houses, they tear down the small ones, add bigger lots, bigger houses. This is the trend. What was more amazing to me is when we took a tour on the river, one of the river boats. Um, and we, took, we got to see the, the view of the river, the back of the houses. So they look great from the front. From the back, they look even more amazing and giant. I mean, the size just, it, it, somehow, it gets bigger. And all, almost all of these people that live on our front are executives of the Big Three. Because Windsor, you know, Detroit, Big Three. Um, no one would drive by those houses or take a riverfront cruise and say, wow, these people must truly be humble. <laughs> I don't, anyway. I, I mean, they're beautiful, they're great, but yeah, okay. You know, we communicate with our money, right? And that is a huge way in which we communicate to the world of our value, right? Or what we value. Giving generously is an act that grows in maturity. Verse 11, so now finish doing it is, sorry, finish doing it as well, so that your readiness and desiring it may be matched by pleading it out of what you have. Did you know the second most generous um, giving generation is Generation X? <laughs> <laughs> all right, okay, there you go. I just lost all respect and humility, didn't I? Okay, <laughs> <laughs> how do you like that? Great antithesis. Generation X, is that our generation? Yeah, let's see, yours is. I think you're just right. Yes, you're right on the edge of that. You're just. Yes, you are. Huh? You're in there with me. <laughs> so you must be generous, right? Okay. It would seem, though, that as you age and mature, you have fewer financial needs and more affluency, right? It's typically kind of how it works in the capitalist society in North America. I mean, states is even bigger. Um, if you really want to get rich, it's easy for the states if you can. It's a great place to get wealthy. Well, let's face it, um, with, um, with generation benefit, 
which generation benefited from financial success more than any other living? Any guess? Huh? Which generation benefited more than any other with success? Financial success. Oh, uh, the the boomers, that's right. Now, actually, I think my dad here uh, is the only one in here that is actually part of what's called the silent generation. The one just before the boomers. So, Bill Tina is a boomer. Mm, yeah, they're boomers. Mom's a boomer. Yeah, just barely. So, I think that's the only one um, that is in the silent generation. Anyway, the silent generation is the most, is the most generous generation. Um, the boomers are the second least generous, yeah, the most prosperous. If you've read enough of the Bible, you see there is a clear pattern of the relationship between wealth and giving. Okay? People don't like to hear that in the church. I tell you, you do not like to hear this. It makes people uneasy. And again, my pastors don't preach about money because you got to preach the whole truth. And it just doesn't sit well with the people that give them the most. That is not the most in generosity, but the most in uh, amount. So let's understand the psychology of giving. When we give, we experience a loss. It's a real, tangible loss. I mean, even if you're giving with a debit card or a credit card or a bank transfer, which is, I mean, it used to be just for cash and rich app, right? It goes in the envelope, uh, and that's how we get in the church, right? It's, it's changed a lot. Uh, at supersonic speed, we start to calculate the loss and what that means for us in our not-so-distant future, right? We begin to think, what am I losing when I make that transaction? Is there something I'm missing out on when I give this? What will I not have as a result of, of giving it? Um, so we, we quickly evaluate that, right? Um, if we see the, you know, we evaluate the cost versus the benefit of giving. Is it more costly or more beneficial? this transaction, this giving. If we're satisfied uh, to give, if we're satisfied, then to give is greater we get, right? If, if, if the satisfaction is greater to give, we're gonna give. If not, we hesitate. And then what happens when we hesitate? We come up with all kinds of reasons to justify our hesitancy. We'd rather spring clean than pay the mortgage, right? Paul makes it clear that giving is not easy. And is it easy for God? Ah, okay, don't raise your hands. <laughs> like that, but is it easy for anyone to give money? Okay, it's easier for some. <laughs> Thank you, Judah. Uh, <laughs> it is easier for some, and the reality is actually it becomes easier. This is what Paul is saying here. Um, we might have a negative experience or attitudes that giving, right? But out of that act, and out of another act, and out of another act, and out of another act, and you get the point, as we go, um, it becomes easier. That's what Paul is saying. Be faithful in giving, uh, and what will change is your attitude towards that giving. So it's okay uh, if it's hard for you to give. Right? This is the area that Paul is addressing with the Corinthians specifically about maturity. Okay? You have all these gifts. Uh, okay, yeah. You have all these gifts already. You're you're able to serve, you've matured. Okay, but here's where we gotta step it up a little bit more. Here's where I am challenging you uh, in what needs to change in your church, in your in your your understanding of giving to those, to your, your brothers and sisters that are in need. Giving faithfully eventually leads to your contentment in giving. That's the point. Um, we eventually give, and this is where the Macedonians were at. They were very mature in their giving because out of nothing, I don't know how that works, but it's like 
the woman with the copper coins, which is almost gets you nowhere financially as a as anything, a business, an organization, a, a charity, right? Um, but out of that joy, out of that giving becomes the, comes the joy down the road if it isn't there now, right? And why will you give? Well, because as you give, you then see and take part in what I said before, God doesn't need your money, he doesn't need you to do anything, but he wants you to. And you will begin to see the mission that God has for you, your part in it. It will become clearer and clearer as you serve, as you give, I mean, not even serving, but that there is a place for you and you will find that a whole lot easier than wondering whether, where you should be, right? Where does God want? Generous giving is based on abundance. But the, that is a matter of fairness your abundance in the present time should supply their need. So statistically, people who make 75000 or more start to give less. Now this is a number of surveys, another, a number of researchers all came up with kind of the same idea, the same pattern. So this was this few, a few years old. Let's, let's just add a little bit to that. Let's say it's 15, 20,000 or so. Statistically, people who make 100000 or more start to give less. Um, so it's not just the Bible talking about this, it's statistics. It's the reality of the financial, um, it's our financial reality in North America. It is not the upper middle class, it's not those on the sunshine list, or those wealthy who give generously. Don't kid yourselves, it was, it's as true today as it was 2,000 years ago. John in his book Revelation addressed it specifically with the church of Laodicea. Laodicea was wealthy. It had money, yet it was considered spiritually dead. The church, the true church, the universal church, always prevails in economic hardship and persecution. Everything may seem great in the rich church, but it's a facade. One of the things we grow grown-ups love to do is to make our kids share, right? We're always cautious when we see our kids being selfish, right? It's a natural trait, it's what kids do, it's what we as humans do. Kids, by nature, typically hate sharing. And so we tell them to share, or we often force it on them, right? We make them share. Our attempts are well-intentioned, we don't want them to be greedy. And while it's important to teach our kids ownership, responsibility, stewardship, generosity, not always should we expect them to share, because why would we expect our kids to share when we don't do it ourselves? We don't model it, what good is it telling our kids to do? If you expect your child to share, well, model it. I remember hearing that a guy, I don't remember this was years ago, he was lamenting the fact that he owned a truck. And why did he, <laughs> some of you know I'm getting that, right? Why did he lament owning a truck? Because who is the guy you call when you need to move furniture or move out to another house or an apartment? Right? You call the guy with the truck. Okay, there, <laughs> there is an acceptable level in the church where we must give when asked. Right? So use that must carefully because, like I said, there shouldn't be any obligation in what we do. It's supposed to be here, right? Um, we should not withhold from a brother or sister who has a reasonable request. Now, if you're asking to use someone's truck every week, it's time to buy a truck. Right? <laughs> There's a limit, right? But reasonable request, we should be willing or get to the, that spot where we are willing to help. The reality is the more that you have, more is required of you. Like it or not, don't be eager to be wealthy if you're not eager to share in that wealth. So, do you find yourself making excuses not to give to people who could use your help? Do you justify reasons not to give to the church because you didn't like the sermon? The church does not provide the right kind of programs for me. Since I didn't attend this week, I'm not obliged to give. There are a lot of pride behind these justifications, and I'm sure we've all done it. Have your own interests, 
become a more important investment than that of the church and the kingdom of God. Our discontentment and lack of humility are big drivers in our attitude towards giving and generosity. Paul is requesting the church to participate in the collection and never once addressed people receiving the money to get off their butts and find some way to make it on their own. That is a cultural lie that people who are poor are lazy. It's also true that biblically that people who are lazy should expect to be poor. Of course, we have so many safety incidents in Canada. That doesn't happen. There are many reasons why people are curious about and attracted to a church plant. But there are a handful of reasons they stay. You've chosen to be a part of Forge for one or more of these reasons. You are on board with the mission vision of the church, right? Or you like the pastor, leaders, and their leadership. Or, and, and or, you found a community in which you belonged and are accepted. God does not need your money, but the church does. As another church planting pastor wondered once said recently, none of this that you see is free. If you have four walls, you have heating, air conditioning, it costs money, right? None of this is free, it costs money to do this. Words of words. God gives us the opportunity to live guilt-free through the humbling of His Son Jesus in the greatest act of generosity possible. There will never be a shortage of opportunity to give, and there will always be plenty of opportunists ready to take. The willingness to discern God's economy will steer our giving. That's that's my that's my rebuttal. <laughs> All right, pray with me, and we are. So far, we, um, we are here, and we are uncomfortable in our own skin at this moment. A little bit, possibly. A lot, maybe. Um, because you've asked us to do something we find very hard to do. Um, we are not that willing to open up our hands as we think we are. Um, but you have a great opportunity for us. You have something that you want us to take part in. And if we can just get to that place of joy, uh, just see that, that it actually is a greater benefit for us to be generous than it is to be someone who always takes. So help us move on that journey where we are in that to um, move in the direction that Paul is asking the Corinthians to. To the place where, you know, God forbid we are somewhere in abject poverty, sometime in the future, but let's hope not. No one wants to be there. I don't know anyone who wants to be there. Um, but we just pray that things get rough, things get hard, and that we are already in a place of joy and are serving and are giving. Amen. 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 Thank you.